Uh, Psalm 51 this morning. Psalm 51. We're in uh, part six of this series called Let Us Pray. We'll finish it up next week as we talk about the prayer of thanksgiving. And then in two weeks, we'll be starting a new series called God Is. But uh, Psalm 51 this morning. While you're turning there, I found this interesting. Back in 2015, while Donald Trump was on the campaign trail, in a venue that was surrounded by evangelical Christians, he stated, people are shocked when they find out, find, find out that, I'm a, that I'm a Protestant. He said, I'm a Presbyterian. And I go to church, love God, love my church. But then the moderator, Frank Luntz, asked Trump whether he's ever asked God for forgiveness. He says, well, I'm not sure I have. I think if I do something wrong, I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that. So, uh, interesting comment. Here's another one. One Texas pastor shared the gospel with a man asking, have you ever committed a sin? And the man said, well, yes, I have, but not in seven years. <laughs> Church, it's really hard for us to walk in right fellowship with God if we don't know how to recognize our own sin and we don't recognize God's prescription for dealing with that sin. All right, so what is sin? Very simply, sin is this. It is anything that we do to disobey or displease God. And you know, it only takes one sin, any sin, for us to be separated from God for all of eternity in torment. Now, here's something, you probably noticed this. Here's something that our culture does. It continually redefines what sin is. Uh, what's not sin? What is sin? Uh, the, the definitions seem to be flexible. But they do that to make morally reprehensible actions seem more palatable. For example, he had an extramarital fling. Now, I think fling is far too flippant a word to describe the sort of betrayal and hurt that adultery causes. Oh, well, they misappropriated funds. No, they stole from the company. <laughs> but you know, even in church, and sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it, but even in church, we tend to either minimize or relabel our sin. Lord, forgive me where I've failed you. Lord, forgive me for my shortcomings. God, I'm so sorry for my weakness. And occasionally you'll find Christians who uh, try to rationalize away their sin. You know, trying to come up with a way to justify what they do as if somehow that's okay with God. Well, God just wants me to be happy. No, God wants you to be holy. And he knows that if you're in the center of his will, there is fullness of joy. Now, let's be honest with ourselves, church. Fact is, we have all sinned, and we all need forgiveness. But more than anybody else who has ever lived, Jesus understood that. That's why he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and he did it willingly. Now, you'll recall from weeks past, among other things that we've already discovered in Jesus' model prayer, this week, he's teaching us the necessity of praying a prayer of confession. In fact, the big idea behind today's message is that confession is the process that tears down the barrier that sin, uh, that barrier that our, that our sin puts between us and God. Okay, got my tang tangled, so let me read that again. Confession is the process that tears down the barrier that our sin puts between us and God. Now, you recall last week, we were in John 17, the, uh, the petition of prayer, where Jesus taught us uh, intercessory prayer as he was praying for his own uh, disciples. And uh, you'll recall he modeled three different prayers of intercession for us. Uh, a prayer for protection, prayer for sanctification, prayer for unification. 
But today, as we use Matthew 6 as our launching point, we're going to take a different look at Jesus' model prayer. And then we're going to jump over to Psalm 51 here in a few minutes. And Psalm 51, church, serves as a great example of prayer, a prayer for forgiveness, for restoration. All right? So as we go through these texts today, you're going to find three very simple prayer requests. Okay? Prayer request number one, forgive me. Forgive me. In his model prayer, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And he says, and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now the parallel passage in Luke chapter 11, verse 4, it says, uh, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us. Now just a quick side note this morning, church. Last week we discussed pretty extensively the prayer for protection. Uh, Prayers for protection from the world, for protection from the evil one. And so we're really not going to use uh, chapter, th- uh, sorry, verse 13 in our study this morning. We're going to kind of set that aside this week since we've already discussed that. But I want you to notice verse 12. Because Jesus does a really interesting thing here in verse 12. He illustrates the need for pardon by teaching us to approach the Father as debtors. In fact, he shows us two kinds of debt here. The first one we'll call our debt to God. Or a theologian might call it our sin debt. Our sins count against us as a debt that needs to be paid. Now, thankfully, Jesus paid that debt for our sin by dying on the cross. So that our sin could be taken away from us forever. In fact, the Greek word here for forgive, it actually means to send away. When he, when you and I rather, receive this gift of salvation, he took our sins far away. Oh, but what happens? Well, you see, even though we've been given salvation, we still end up sinning against God, don't we? Yes, we're forgiven sinners, free from the ultimate penalty of sin, But we can't pretend that we don't sin anymore. So don't tell me that it's been seven years since you've sinned, okay? That's why Jesus wants us to talk candidly to our Heavenly Father about our sin. Because if we'll just take that to to the Father, He will forgive us. Now, when we do that, here's something else that's really cool. Being transparent with God about our sin, you know what that does? It just creates a deeper relationship, a deeper intimacy with God when we're just, when we're real with Him. That relationship with God actually becomes more robust because we were willing to come to Him with our sin. Now, in the original language, the form, of the, verb tra- um, the form of the verb that's translated as forgive, it carries the sense of immediate action. Uh, you know, Jesus was basically urging us to pray, forgive me now. Or in other words, we have a need to confess our sins without delay. Because, listen carefully, because unconfessed sin is really an obstruction to a powerful prayer life. See, the reason that our our, our, uh, our prayers sometimes go unanswered, it's really all because of uncleanness in the human heart. Now, I deal with that particular matter more extensively in the book, if you want to get a copy of that. But listen to these scriptures here. Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Proverbs 28, 13, but whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Christians, if we want to be able to boldly approach God's throne in prayer, we have got to be certain that we are walking 
in holiness. So confession of our sin is, is vital to an effective prayer life. But I, I don't want you to overlook what else Jesus is saying here in verse 12. We talked about our debt to God. Let's talk for a moment about others' debt to us. He says, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. So we need to be mindful that when we confess our sin to God, He forgives us in the same measure that we forgive others. And if we harbor unforgiveness towards others, God won't forgive us. In fact, Jesus makes that very clear in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. He says, if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now let's be honest with one another for, for just a moment. That choice to forgive, sometimes it's really hard, y'all. I mean, when we've been hurt, when we've been wounded, betrayed, it's hard to make that choice to forgive. But let me tell you, there's so many benefits when you do. I mean, the most obvious is what we just discussed, that God forgives us with the same measure we forgive others. But think about it. When you willingly choose to forgive someone, your anger is gone. That burden that's been weighing on you, that burden of carrying a grudge is lifted from your shoulders. That feeling of being offended no longer has control over your emotions. And you know the person that hurt you no longer lives rent free right here in your mind. And you know what? When you choose to forgive, very often there's a relationship that's restored. It was toward the end of my first pastorate, uh, the youth minister's wife, who had a really short fuse, y'all. She took it upon herself to slander me to, to pretty much anyone in the church that was willing to listen. What she did, I mean, it was deeply hurtful. I mean, primarily because what she had said was very inflammatory and it was just plain untrue. But you see, over the next few months that followed in my daily prayers, I began saying, God, I choose to forgive. Today, I choose forgiveness. Now, when I chose to choose forgiveness, that's kind of redundant, and it chose to choose. When I chose forgiveness, when I decided to make that decision every single day, a wonderful thing happened. You see, eventually, the forgiveness that I chose in my mind migrated to my heart. In fact, I can tell you the exact moment it happened. I was sitting at an intersection, uh, Fourth and Quaker in Lubbock, Texas, driving my old 95 red Camry. It was all beat up. And I'm sitting there at the red light, and then suddenly, ding! You know, like a, like a light bulb being switched on. There it was! The forgiveness had migrated from here to here. Now, when I got home, I sent her an email. I said, you know, you said some very, very hurtful things about me, but I want you to know that I forgive you. Not really expecting to hear a reply. And surprisingly, a few hours later, an email ar arrived in my inbox, and it was her expressing repentance. But what would be the dangers to me if I had chosen not to forgive? Well, that means I'm probably holding on to anger and bitterness. I'm letting it grow and fester and become toxic until it works its way out into my life in a very destructive way. Or maybe I'm carrying around that angst that, that comes from shouldering the burden of a grudge. Maybe I'm giving control of my emotions over to someone else. And you know what? That relationship that was injured, there would be no hope of restoration. You see, church, unforgiveness is like this. Unforgiveness is like you taking poison and expecting the other person to die. And so we find here in Jesus' teaching that forgiveness brings freedom, not just from him forgiving us, but from us choosing to forgive one another. But now we come to Psalm 51. 
Most of you are familiar with the psalm. King David wrote that psalm after the prophet Nathan confronted him about his adultery with Bathsheba, uh, the subsequent murder of her husband. And in the psalm, a very repentant David willingly confessed his sin and sought God's forgiveness. But he also prayed for spiritual renewal, for restoration. Okay, so prayer, num uh, prayer request number one, forgive me. Prayer request number two, cleanse me. Look at verse one there in Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop. Now I'll be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. So look at what David's pleading for here. Mercy, <laughs> compassion, cleansing. God, remove my guilt. Blot it out. Wash away my guilt, God, and cleanse me. Now, in David's day, you know, God's people would actually go through a ceremonial washing of themselves before they came into his presence to worship. And this ceremonial cleansing really prepared them to meet God. And, and David was familiar with the custom. And David knew that his, his, his ugly, his vile sin needed to be removed like, well, like filth, needing to be washed out of his dirty robes. And so David asked God to cleanse him spiritually so that he could be fit for worship once more. Now, I want you to look at verse 3 here. King David says, I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. You ever got that one thought stuck in your head that you just can't get rid of? and you keep turning it over and over. I mean, a penetrating thought over and over and over in, my, in your mind again, and, and you're completely incapable of expelling it. Now for me, that usually happens around 4 a.m. There's an earworm that wakes me up at four o'clock and the words, the lyrics, the melody begins playing over and over and over in my head. I desperately want to go back to sleep. I remember one time, and, and I don't know why four o'clock is the magic hour, but it's about four o'clock. I wake up. I'm wide awake. And right there in my head, the things we do for love, like walking in the rain and the snow when there's nowhere to go, and you feel like a part of you is dying. And yes, I was dying. Make it stop. I mean, even after I concede defeat, and give up trying to sleep. That earworm is still burrowing through my subconscious. And usually the only thing that can banish it is, well, listening to another song. But you see, that was David. He couldn't get the guilt of his sin to vacate his thoughts. It always tormented him. Couldn't get his mind off of his rebellion against God. His sin pierced his conscience. And so he longed for God's mercy, for his cleansing. Look at verse four. David says, against you, you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Little Susie, age three, sat with her parents one evening at a baptismal service. This is a new experience for her. She turns to her mom and says, why did Pastor Bob push that guy into the water? 
And her mother quietly tried to explain, but Susie wasn't satisfied, so later they went home. They talked about people deciding to live for Jesus and how they wanted everyone to know about it. And they explained that water is a picture of Jesus washing away people's sin so that they'll come out clean and be able to live, well, to be good for him. Oh, but mom and dad still failed once more. Susie asked, why didn't Pastor Bob just spank him? You see, David deserved far worse than just a divine spanking. He acknowledged that God was right to pass sentence. But because God is merciful, when David came to him in repentance, he was gracious to forgive. He was gracious to provide what David was longing for, cleansing. Look at verse 7. Purify me with hyssop. Now, hyssop's an herb that's used for, for cleaning, for cleansing. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Now, parents, you no doubt remember those days when your, your tiny humans were particularly small. You know, maybe they were outside on a hot summer day playing, and they'd come inside covered head to toe with all sorts of dirt and filth and grime, desperately in need of a bath. And you remember at that age, bath time is a big production. You draw the bath water, you, you pour in the bubble bath, you make sure it's just the right temperature, and then you plop the wee munchkin right down into the warm water. And you start scrubbing. And the little guy feels the soap suds start to cleanse his skin. The dirt washes away, revealing the child's true beauty underneath. But how much of the work did the boy actually do? None. He doesn't do any of the cleaning. He relies on his father to do the cleaning. You see, after his sin with Bathsheba, David didn't say, God, I, I want to restore my relationship with you, but I really got to get myself cleaned up first. No, he knew it didn't work that way. Instead, admitting his own inability to cleanse his own sin, here's what he said, you wash me and I will be whiter than snow. God, do for me what I can't do for myself. Now, church, you and I, we're kids in a bubble bath. David was a kid in a bubble bath, crying, wash me, daddy. But you see, when we come to him and ask for pardon, for forgiveness, his grace washes over us like a cleansing flood. And in that moment, we are made new, we are made pure once again, and the weight of our transgressions is lifted. And then we can begin to walk in freedom and joy once more. First John 1 John 1.9 states that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse me, Father. And that's the prayer that, that David is praying here. But there's another one we see in Psalm 51, okay? Prayer number three, restore me. Restore me. Look at verse 10. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. And verses 10 through 12 here, we hear David make a couple of pleas, actually. And this is great. I mean, Psalm 51 is so amazing because for us, when we have sinned against God and, and need forgiveness and cleansing, Psalm 51 is just kind of like a, a soothing balm that we can use to heal our self-inflicted wounds, more to the point that God will use. 
But here's the first plea we see in these verses. A plea for restoration. Verse 12, he says, Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Restore. And, and you know, just like David, we should be praying that prayer. God, restore me. Or we should be asking God for what scholars would call a tabula rasa. Okay? Don't have to remember that term. Tabula rasa, though, it's actually Latin. The literal translation means clean slate. Now, if you to work, look up uh, the word tabula rasa in the dictionary, it's going to say a restoration of something to its pristine state. Think of it this way, art lovers. There's an exquisite painting. You know, maybe it's a Rembrandt or a, a, a Van Gogh. It's been tarnished by years of neglect and mistreatment. Colors have faded, canvas is torn, and the once vibrant image is, is, is barely recognizable. But then one day, a skilled artist comes across the painting and sees the potential for restoration. And with careful attention and precision, the artist begins that meticulous process of restoring that painting to its former glory. He carefully touches up the colors. He repairs the tears. He brings out the beauty that had been hidden beneath the damage. And church, in very much the same way, God desires to restore the beauty that's in us that's been marred by sin's damage. And he will. I mean, if we'll just seek his pardon, you might be feeling broken, tarnished, unworthy, but God sees in you the masterpiece that you were created to be. And he meticulously works in our hearts, healing the wounds that our sin has caused, renewing our spirits, making us whole, lovingly restoring us to something so beautiful. But why did David need restoration? Well, that's because his intimacy with God had been shattered. I mean, if there was any hope for that to be restored, something miraculous was going to have to take place. And that miraculous something? Renewal. Okay, that's the second plea we see here. Look at verse 10. It's a plea for renewal. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Folks, that's a very powerful and, and poignant request. Now, what really intrigues me about this, though, is that the, the Hebrew word that David chose for create, the word is bara. And that word has a very distinct connection to Genesis 1.1. You see, bara is the very same word that detailed God's creation of the universe. And so really, what David was asking for was for God to perform a miracle of creation in his heart and life. His relationship with God had to be restored, but it would require the creation of a brand new heart, something that only God had the power to create. You know, church, when, when King David committed adultery and murder, his life veered way off course. Now, before we wag a, a finger of condemnation at David, we need to remember that, you know, sometimes we veer off course too. Uh, now, we may not be guilty of the same sins as David, but all of us have strayed from the path at some point. But the good news, church, the good news is that we can always start over again. That's what God allows us to do because he is merciful. And so we can begin again. A, a tabula rasa, a clean slate. And that's exactly what happened with David. He sought the Lord in prayer to find restoration of something that had been destroyed. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. 
But you see, what made David a man after God's own heart obviously wasn't his sin and in the failures, failures in his life. It, it was his spirit, his desire afterward, after he had sinned. And so David turned back to God wholeheartedly because he yearned for freedom from sin. He longed for the, the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in his life once again. David desired a heart like God's. A heart like ours can be if we'll simply pray, God forgive us our debts. And so we come full circle to the big idea. Confession is that process that tears down the barrier that sin puts between us and God. And so we pray, Father, forgive me, cleanse me, restore me. Because without our cries for pardon, our fellowship with God has disrupted Christians and we have no power to live this Christian life. David's given us a lot to consider this morning in his prayer of repentance and confession. So how do we take this? And how do we put feet to our faith? How are we gonna inject these truths into our own lives? Well, as I typically do, I'm gonna give you three action steps, okay? Now, the, these are very simple. I mean, this is basic Christianity 101 kind of stuff. Here's the first one. Admit sin. Swallow your pride and admit your sin. Not just one of these blanket God forgive me prayers. Confess your individual sin specifically. Instead of saying, God, please forgive me for my sin. No, that's not gonna cut it. And if you don't know what they are, ask God to show you. Ask the Lord to reveal any unconfessed sin. Bible says in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Ask God to reveal these things to you and then turn from them. That's repentance. We turn from our sin, we turn back to God. Turn from them, seek his forgiveness, and thank him for his cleansing. All right, now here's the second one. Abide in the word. Abide in the word. Let God speak to you through his word. I would suggest that you read and pray through Psalm 51, for starters. Meditate on that. Or really any of the other passages in the Bible that deal with forgiveness. And as God shows you new things, ask God to give you a renewed sense of dependence on him, like David, to create a deeper fellowship, a deeper intimacy with God. Now here's the third one. Ask forgiveness from others. I mean, if others have been hurt by some sin that you've committed, confess that sin to God. Ask him. Ask him to forgive you. But then go to that person that you've hurt. Ask that person, ask him or her to forgive you and to begin the process of restoring that relationship. Now folks, if you've never come to God for forgiveness and salvation, see there's a barrier that's already there that sin has created and it bars you from him. It bars you from having a relationship with God at all. And, and people think they can overcome that sin barrier, that chasm between us and God. They try to impress God by attempting to, to be a good person, live a good life, to clean themselves up before they come to God. But you know, like that little toddler in the bathtub, 
We can't clean ourselves up. We have to come to God dirty and let the Father do all of the cleansing. Some of you might be here and you're thinking, Eric, that sounds well and good, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know the horrendous things that I've done. God could never forgive me. Oh, yes, he can. Let me tell you something, folks. There is no sin too grievous. There is no pit too deep, no path too far that God can't reach you, that he can't, can't, can't bring you back to him, to bring you into a, a new relationship with him. You see, when you come to him in repentance and faith, there's something wild that happens, y'all. God performs a miracle of creation in your heart and life. God does something that only he can. He creates a brand new heart within you. And you become a new person in him. And as a result of that, you can enjoy relationship with God both now and for eternity you'll come to Christ in repentance and faith. Now, if you're here this morning and you have trusted Christ for salvation, then understand that because of God's grace towards you, you're no longer barred from relationship with him. But unconfessed sin does disrupt our fellowship with him. That's why every day we need to be praying, God, Forgive me, cleanse me, restore me. In just a moment, we're gonna have a time of response. The altar's gonna be open. I would encourage you to come and whatever you're struggling with, give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord.